there is a spike in inflation right now, this year, and we have to uh, avoid that it becomes structural. There is a need to invest more in semiconductors so that uh, we can get rid of this dependency. The second half is more difficult, and that is what we see now. It is more difficult. It's here to stay the problem for many months. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Monday, the 6th of September. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Disappointing jobs numbers, while the smallest increase in seven months adds to uncertainty over the Fed's taper timeline, the U.S. is, of course, closed for Labor Day. Aluminium surge prices hit a decade high as a coup in Guinea fuels concern over supply of a key raw material. Plus, we're live at the Munich Auto Show. Don't miss our conversations with the chief executive of BVW and BMW, plus many, many more. Now, let's get straight to the markets. European stocks actually gaining this morning along U.S. futures. Of course, investors now betting that a slower hiring in the U.S. may delay tapering. That's after a very disappointing jobs report on Friday. 235,000 payrolls were actually added in the month, around 500,000 short of estimates. Now, you can see a little bit of pressure on the stocks, European 600. I mean, not pressure, but it's not gaining by that much, 0.5%. Just a reminder, uh, cash treasuries are closed today, as is most of the U.S. in terms of volume. We're expecting a pretty thin volume trading session. Here are some guests reacting to that jobs report. This was a materially lower number. It's a weaker report. The first read is, is definitely this has some Delta variant uh, on it. This is the long game right now coming out of a, a worldwide pandemic. There's one huge red flag for me in this payrolls report. The hospitality number and the restaurant number. Zero jobs were created in leisure hospitality. We had almost zero gain this month in, in that area. You'll get some bounce back here in September. The market's looking through this and seeing, hey, this is temporary. Tapering is still very much on the table. The Fed is going to taper. The market is now pushing back any sort of Fed taper announcement to November, maybe December. They don't need to rush into it. And the most important thing not to lose sight of here is the emphasis that, that tapering is not tightening. Well, joining us now to talk about that jobs report to the Fed and inflation is our Eddie van der Waal of Bloomberg Markets Live. Eddie, I enjoy talking uh, to you about inflation in between also our chats on pets. I mean, the, the market reaction to that huge miss from NFP was pretty, pretty bland. So it was a really mixed report, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah. it? Because, I mean, on the one hand, yes, jobs growth was really slow. But on the other hand, you know, you had that, in, that, that boost to inflation from average hourly earnings, which is just really hard for the market to interpret. And frankly, for the first hour after the report came out, the market didn't know what to make of it, right? We had stocks up, we had stocks down. Good news was going to be bad news, and then people thought, well, listen, you know, this bad, bad is so news. bad yeah. that it's actually bad. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's going to take, even now, I think people are struggling to interpret it, and I think we are going to wait for Fed speakers to come in and right. start to tell us what to make of it. Right. I mean, what do you make of it? Is it, you know, can it, it can't be only seasonality, but actually the fact that it was the end of August, does it, you know, contribute to some of the volatility that we could have seen? I think some of that. I also think that, I, th I think that if this is, if, if the job growth was slow because, there, you know, there's, there's a lack of openings, I'd be very worried. But openings are very high. I think what's going on is companies are struggling to fill positions. I think that's what's, what's happening here. And I think for that meter, for, for that reason, it's more inflationary than people think, yeah. and it's it's probably a more optimistic view of the economy overall. I think you know there are people who are holding out for the right kind of positions, but there is a, there is a, there is friction in the job market, you know, with high unemployment and high openings, yeah. and that is a conundrum that the market is is struggling to interpret. And it, could it be actually a huge shift on how we look at the labour market? So if it's struggling to fill in positions, does the structural basis? I don't know whether it's pandemic and so people want to work from home, so you don't go after. Does it actually? point to a changing labor market that could confuse the Fed. Right, I think so. And I, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that that's, those structural issues are going to be short term either. Right. Because, you know, a lot of people uh, got furloughed, um, lost jobs for other reasons. And I think, you know, and the, and the kinds of jobs they see opening up as delivery drivers, as these sorts of things, you know, and now in, in restaurants as those reopen, uh, you know, it might not be the, the, the kind of jobs that they are looking for. And I think, you know, people might... And, you know, as long as we keep stimulus going, um, people might be happy to, 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 to not take the first opportunity that comes up. So I think these, these are going to be difficult issues to solve. 
Um, so, Eddie, we have a, a pretty big week actually ahead of us. I mean, today, so the U.S. markets are closed, so we're going to get probably thin volumes, not much going on in Treasuries. We could hear from President Biden about whether he reconfirms Jay Powell or not. Mm -hmm. We have a Reserve Bank of Australia um, a meeting, I think, this week. We have some China trade data. What's your next data point? For me, I, it's, I, I was, you know, I, for me, it's all about the Vage book. I think for me, it is all about anecdotal data and high frequency data and these sorts of things because the high frequency data showed us before Friday that the jobs report might disappoint. And I think the, the but the Fed will, Fed speakers will want to talk, you know, to people and find out what it is that is, that is causing the trouble in the labor market. And that will inform their view a lot, I think, as we go towards uh, September. I know you look at commodities and, you know, today there's a huge swing in aluminium and this is because there's been a coup in Guinea. We'll talk about the, the politics of it in just a second, but it means that there's a scarcity of bauxite, right, which is right. used to make aluminium. Right. How long can this last? So, I mean, I think the, how long the specific issue lasts, I don't know, but it is it does underline just how difficult supply chains have been in the commodity markets, right? And the moment you see a small disruption, a disruption like this one might not have caused the price to react quite as much. But the fact that we've got port closures in China, that we already have stretched supply chains and so on, I think that just causes these knock-on implications, which which hurts the, which pushes the price significantly higher. Eddie, thank you so much for the update. Eddie van der Valt there from our Bloomberg Markets live team. Now, let's get more on the story. Aluminium has climbed to the highest in more than a decade. This is as political unrest in Guinea fueled concerns over supply of the raw material needed to make the metal. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Paul Richardson. Paul, good morning. So what do we actually know about this so far? The situation on the ground is pretty calm at the moment. After the coup yesterday, the coup leader issued a state statement last night saying that he's going to be meeting the members of the ousted cabinet um, to plot the way forward. Um, the key concerns, as Eddie was touching on a short while ago, um, are what the impact is on um, transport in and out of uh, Guinea from the mines, the bauxite mines, the, the, um, the gold mines and the, um, the iron ore mines in Guinea. Um, so is this likely to actually cause lingering uncertainty in the region as a whole, Paul? Sorry, say it again. How much uncertainty does it cause to the, to the rest of the region? Look, West Africa is, has been a fairly unstable region in recent months. Um, we've had coups in places like Mali, um, Chad, and um, Gambia. Um, there's a potential response coming from the regional economic bloc, the economic community of West African states. They may impose trade sanctions on the, um, the coup leaders. Um, that could further constrain supplies of bauxite from Guinea to the world market. The, that said, there is, um, there's not that much support for the the ousted president just because he, when he came to power late last year, he had um, asked, he had sought a third term after having a constitutional um, referendum to amend it to allow him to continue serving. So he's slightly unpopular in the region, and the question is just how hard ECOWAS, the regional bloc, will push to have him removed. All right, Paul, thank you so much for the update. Paul Richards in there on Guinea. Now, stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition because later on in the program, we discuss the latest on the German election. As the SPD is said to aim for a coalition with the Greens, today we'll discuss a climate issue. The DIW president and the head of ESG at Bayern Invest join us today. If you have any questions for our guests, please IB plus TV Go. You can also tweet me directly. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's discuss private equity with our next guest. He's Antoine Flammarion, Tico Capital Chairman. Now Tico is a pan-European asset manager and investor. It has more than 30 billion euros in assets under management. And earlier this year, it, for example, joined forces with billionaire Bernard Arnault and former Unicredit chief executive Jean-Pierre Mustier to launch a blank check company. Now the resulting SPAC raised 500 million euros, making it the biggest of its kind in Europe. Well, Antoine Flammarion, welcome to Bloomberg. We have a lot to talk about, and I kind of, Antoine, want to start, you know, talking about markets. So if you look at the stock market, it, there's a pretty heavy private, you know, presence of people thinking that it will go up. I don't know whether you're also seeing a lot of private money uh, going into companies such as Tico Ho, just because the world is awash with cash. 
Hello, Francine. Hello, everybody. Yeah, it's a good question, and market are probably at uh, more or less all-time high, and, and we all know that you know central bank uh, have been helping that uh, dramatically, and, and you know it's a big question. I think my first comment would be on inflation. Inflation is there, and, and we just discussed briefly uh, aluminium, which is obviously tied to, to Guinea. What happened, but but. Even before that, aluminium was, was almost at all-time high. And what we see right now is that multiple are crazy, valuation are very high. So we think that it would be really tied up to central bank intervention. But because inflation is coming, it could change very quickly. And nowadays, change, change are, things are changing very fast. Um, and, and when we look at what happened uh, you know, in Chinese-related stocks, either Alibaba or Tencent, or during the summer with Amazon, uh, you know, things could change very fast uh, with the market. We all saw and we all have in mind what happened uh, in March 2020 with, with, with the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but I think the velocity of the market uh, evolved. So on our side, we are probably cautious, uh, but there are tons right. of opportunities on the other end as well, and I, and I come to that in a minute. So, Antoine, do you have any exposure to China with any of your deals? If the market, I mean, you seem to suggest that the market is going to move very quickly. I know you're committed to, for example, defense, you're committed to ESG causes. Like, how nimble and how quickly do you need to change tack when there are either supply chain issues or, or there's, you know, cracking down in China? Yeah, you know, out of our 31 billion of AUM, uh, we only have 4.5 billion of, of liquid assets. So the remaining uh, remain private assets, private equity, private debt, uh, real estate. So, you know, obviously our investment pace is a little bit uh, longer and we are not obliged, you know, to change the cursor. I mean, TKO is not an hedge fund uh, per se. So, so, you know, we try to anticipate the long term. Uh, our exposure in Asia is mainly done through our Singaporean uh, office, um, but we've got limited uh, exposure to, to uh, Chinese stock or Chinese economy directly. We've got indirect exposure. Um, but, you know, you have to be uh, very uh, reactive and on the ball because, as I said, things are changing very, very fast. So it's important to have the long-term view, uh, make sure that you manage money for the long term, which, which is fairly rare. But because of the structure of the money we manage, more than 10 years mm -hmm. uh, length on average, uh, it's easier for us to maneuver and anticipate the, the, the longer trend. You mentioned energy transition, yeah. same thing for cybersecurity, same thing for aerospace. Um, right. So, uh, so, Antoine, are you feeling like when you hold, I mean, is there a trend in private equity once you have a good company to hold on to it longer maybe than you would have five, 10 years ago? And if there yeah, is, I, why? I mean, usually people have done, you know, control LBO and, and, and with an average length of, you know, let's say four, four to five years uh, tenure. I think what's changing now in private equity is that you see more and more people investing in minority private equity, trying to help company to grow. It's, it's been done in, in tech, obviously, but in other sectors. So I think one of the large trends is we see more and more minority private equity. And the second trend is a long dated fund or investment vehicle, including evergreen vehicle. When you when you back a company, especially in new markets, and it's hydrogen, it's solar, it's cybersecurity, as mentioned before, you need time. Things are moving fast, but if you really want to grow a company uh, and create more value for your shareholder and your and, and your investor, I think you know long dated funds uh, is a big trend. So I say two trends: minority on one end. And, and, and long dated uh, investment vehicle on the other end. And that's what, what we're trying to do here. Antoine, when you look at some of the, the green investments that you're talking about, and we see that in asset management, I know you're longer term and longer trend and more ingrained in the real economy, but how do you avoid greenwashing? So you mentioned hydrogen. You can have blue hydrogen, you can have green hydrogen. And how fast you know, will this sector actually move with renewables and prices? So w where do you find the best value right now? I think, first of all, it takes time. So what you saw in the last two to three years is that a lot of people uh, have been, you know, uh, doing some greenwashing and, and, and entertaining the fact that, you know, they became suddenly green. But we know that it takes time. Uh, so first of all, it takes time, especially if you have legacy assets and all the large institution, banks, asset manager, you've got legacy assets. So it takes time uh, to change that. Um, you know, we used to say, you know, it's important to innovate, and, and, and here at TKO, we've been really trying to innovate. So, for instance, we launched uh, Energy Transition uh, back almost five years ago. So it's not 20 years ago, it's only five years ago. 
Uh, to do that, we partner with Total, which has been a very uh, early mover, uh, despite the fact that they've got, obviously, their own legacy asset, oil, gas, and all that. But we started five years ago, and now we start seeing the benefits uh, because there are mm -hmm. more and more foreign companies uh, entering there. But it takes time. You know, it's, uh, uh, even if it's the, the flavor of the month, uh, it takes time, and, and people have to be patient. Antoine, talk to me a little bit about you know some of the the sector funds that you have in in defense. I know you're also involved, for example, in Asa Aerofondo in Spain. So how do you see this industry evolving? Yeah, and, and you mentioned trend in private equity. What we see is minority, long dated fund, and you start seeing sector focus fund, which is a little bit new because usually people, investor, would like to invest in more you know diverse pool uh, of assets. We think that. You know, because things are changing fast and because of the pandemic, uh, some sector became suddenly super appealing. And, and aerospace, and we've been involved there, um, is, is one, obviously, uh, of, the, of the key sector. So we decided to partner uh, with Industrial, which is something we do at TKO. So we partner with Safran, Airbus, Dassault, Thales, and we launch an aero fund in France and one in Spain uh, as well. And, you know, the idea is, is really to invest in this vertical, with the right industrial partner, the right team, obviously, uh, because when mm -hmm. you have people doing aerospace all day long, teaming up with the largest uh, company in the world, then you know you, you can consider that probably you're going to do a better investment. But but, but the, sec the sector has suffered a lot, obviously, as we all know. Uh, but you know you have to be contrarian, and, and the best way to create value for your shareholder and investor is to be contrarian. And, and I think this uh, sector-specific fund. Uh, was an obvious thing uh, for us and for our DNA. Uh, and that, that's been you. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, no, 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 I was, I was saying, you know, it, it has been, you know, defensive because the sector was, was, was turbulent. On the other hand, you can be offensive and, and, and we launch a, a fund uh, focus on cybersecurity because there, as you mm -hmm. all know, there are threats everywhere. Uh, same idea, another vertical. So you can be offensive or defensive. Uh, but sector-specific uh, fund uh, offers good value, we think. Antoine, thank you so much. Antoine Flammarion there, Tico Capital Chairman. Now, stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we discuss the latest on the German election. As the SPD is set to aim for a coalition with the Greens, today we'll discuss the climate issue. The DAW president and the head of ESG at Bayern Invest joins us today. Now, if you have any questions for our guests, IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I don't think that it should come as any surprise that there is a spike in inflation right now, this year. We are not concerned by uh, the current level of uh, inflation uh, in the EU or everywhere in the world. Inflation is uh, very much influenced by energy prices and food prices. All the institutions consider that it will be a transitory feature and we have to uh, avoid that it becomes structural. We think that this increase is a temporary one. We are monitoring it and we should monitor it very accurately, uh, but without um, going to uh, conclusions too soon. We remain vigilant, but we are not concerned. It is a natural feature of a very strong recovery that we're witnessing. European finance minister is speaking about inflation at the Ambrosetti Forum in Italy. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The Taliban say they have captured the northern Panchia province, the last pocket of resistance standing in the way of complete control over Afghanistan. A spokesman for the group said opposition fighters had now fled the province. The Taliban are expected to announce details of their new government soon. The UK's biggest business lobby has criticised the government over labour shortages, warning they could last as long as two years. CBI Director General Tony Danker says a perfect storm of Brexit cutting the supply of workers from the EU and the pandemic have left many sectors without the staff they do need. The CBI once targeted immigration to fill job gaps. 
The London Metal Exchange will reopen its iconic ring open cry trading floor today after closing it 18 months ago due to the pandemic. The ring is the last spot in Europe where traders still set benchmark prices by shouting out orders at one another. But many fear that volumes will be sharply lower than before the closure, possibly making the ring's continued operation uneconomical. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, Germany's election is looming on the horizon. Environmental issues, of course, have been a key battleground for parties. We get the latest on that next with our German election special. This is Bloomberg. The SPD opens a five-point gap ahead of the CDU with just three weeks to go ahead of the German election. Armin Laschet visits the flood-hit regions of the country as activist Luisa Neubauer says no German party is doing enough to halt climate change. We'll hear from our interview. Plus, we're also live at the Munich Auto Show. Don't miss our conversations with the chief executives of Volkswagen and BMW. How will Germany's big, big manufacturers manage the transition to clean energy? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Welcome to Germany Decides, a series of special programs in the lead up to the German election on September 26. Now, it's less than three weeks until Germany's election. Environmental issues have been a key battleground for the parties. With a heavy reliance on coal for electricity generation and a thriving industrial sector, the country is Europe's biggest polluter. Now, but can Germany cut its carbon footprint without actually denting jobs and economic growth? Well, let's get more from Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo over in Berlin. Maria, good morning to you. A lot of the talk, of course, is on what kind of coalition we could get. Where are we on climate change? Is it really left front and center in this election campaign? Yes, Francine, it really is. This is a huge talking point going into the election. When you look at polls, they tell you that close to 40 percent of Germans view this as a top priority for the next coalition government. There's a number of factors, of course, that are feeding into this. One is the demographics. We do see the new generations who say we want to go greener and climate is a big priority for us. You have the European push going into this. Remember, the European Commission has made the Green Deal the cornerstone of European policy for the next 30 years. And then, Francine, of course, we had the floodings that happened just a few uh, months ago here in Germany, and that's had a huge impact on the German psyche. You know, the fact that more than 170 people died because of extreme weather has really made this now a conversation that really resonates. So when you look at the different manifestos from pretty much everyone, the uh, CDU, the SPD, and of course, the Greens, they all say climate neutrality will have to happen in the next uh, 20 years. Now, the issue here is what kind of policies and also the targets. And that's when you see the differences between them begin to trickle down. So, Maria, what can you tell us about the possible coalitions? I know there's various possibilities, but, you know, could the Greens end up being kingmakers? Well, you know, at this point, Francine, the, the assumption is that the Greens will join in whatever coalition, whether this is led by the SPD and you go for a traffic lights or you go uh, with the CDU and uh, that becomes a Jamaica formula going into this, they will play a key part. So they will have a big say when it comes to climate policies. And when you look in detail at their manifesto, they have the most ambitious targets. They say Germany needs to be climate neutral in the next two decades. So put that at 2040, that is 10 years before the European deadline, which is 2050. And they also say when it comes to diesel and heavily polluting cars, they need to be taken off the road. However, for the CDU, that would be something that would be difficult uh, to stomach, especially also too for the German industry, which says that until now they don't have clear guidance. The CDU does say that you need to find a way to protect both climate and the environment. But as you know, the German government in particular, uh, led by Angela Merkel, has not had a good track record when it comes to climate reforms. 
All right, thank you so much, our Maria today over there with the very latest from Berlin. Now, joining us to discuss all of these issues, green issues, but also what kind of coalitions we could be looking at in Germany, Marcel Frecher and Bernhard Grünhelb. Well, Marcel is the director of the DIW, or the German Institute for Economic Research. Bernhard is the head of investment strategy at ESG Research at Bayern Invest. So thank you both for joining us. We'll talk uh, in just a couple of minutes about the green energy transition and what kind of coalition is best. But Marcel, let me start off with you. When you look at the various possibility of coalitions, the polls and actually the margin error, is everything still to play or is there a hunch that actually, you know, the, the green, the Greens will play, if not a significant part, at least a part in the next government? It is very likely that the Green Party will be part of the next government. It's also very likely that the Liberal Party uh, will be part of the next government. So it's very likely that there will can be no two-party coalition having enough votes, uh, which means the two most likely outcomes are either a traffic light coalition, so the Social Democrats with the Chancellor Scholz and the Greens and Liberals, or the Conservatives with uh, Mr. Laschet uh, and the Greens and the Liberals. And as you described, the Greens are the mo most progressive, the most ambitious, uh, the party with the clearest plan and measures on climate protection. Uh, the Liberals are probably the most critical among uh, possible coalition partners who only want, don't only want to push back the deadline of climate neutrality, uh, but also who put a very clear priority on reducing debt uh, and mm -hmm. fulfilling the debt break over uh, public investment, including in climate protection. So both parties are likely to be in, and it's very interesting how this will play out. Bernhardt, when you look at the main issues, what do you think people will actually vote on, you know, come September 26? So there, there's a lot of talk, there's, you know, polls, but September 26, you're a mom or a dad or, you know, a single 20-year-old Berliner, and you're, you're about to actually decide who you vote for. Has it changed from the last election, your priorities and what you're afraid of? I would definitely say so, yes. Um, climate um, issues are high on the agenda, even not um, top on the agenda of, of most um, electing, um, of most people, and especially, of course, in, in, among the younger um, um, people, it, it's high on the agenda. Uh, but so is um, also the fiscal and tax policy and the social security system. So we have a couple of important issues at these um, elections at stake. and. Um, it's in the end. Um, it's it's interesting to see how how the um, government um, will will form and how the coalition negotiations will translate into really into the into the politics that are and then um, pursued by the new government. But in the end, we have a, a lot of um, interesting topics and um, climate policy is is high on the agenda for sure. All right, thank you both. Marcel Fretcher there and Bernard Gungel stay with us and we'll talk also about possible inflation shocks and some of the other things in the campaign. Coming up, despite a summer of devastating floods, activist Luisa Nobayer says no parties are doing enough to halt climate change. We hear from one of the organizers of the school strike for climate movement in Germany. That's up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, after a summer that saw devastating floods across parts of the country, climate change has become a key issue ahead of the German election on September 26. But activist and campaigner Luisa Neubauer says that no German parties are doing enough to keep the country on the right track to halt climate change. Well, she spoke with our Maria Tadeo. Speaking of one of the richest countries in the world, we are speaking of one of the high emitting countries in the world. We have a huge moral, historic and current um, responsibility. And there is not a single um, plan of a party that is actually fitting what is needed for 1.5 degrees. That's huge. That's such a scandal. And we need to talk about that. We need to talk about the inability um, and the lack of any kind of political will to actually speak about the danger of the climate crisis and provide a plan that is suitable for the crisis itself. When you hear that Armin Laschet says and the CDU 
we yeah. don't want to spend and take on more debt because it would be bad for uh, the yeah. younger Germans. You know, you, you represent many of those Germans. Is that a yeah. false premise? Well, I would love to talk about the financial debt that we will see in 2050 or 2080. Um, but for that, we would kind of need to have like a livable planet to be on. So right now, the ecological debt that the government is taking up and that is putting on our shoulders is irresponsible. It's absurd. And it's in, it's, there's no way to justify that. So we know that everything you do today to prevent the worst damages of the climate crisis will pay off later. Um, and we know that the delaying action is just more costly. Um, it's taking not only more money, but also more lives and more livelihoods. So, of course, that's uh, the way one of the chancellor candidates, Armin Laschet, um, is arguing here is uh, completely twisted and far away from the scientific evidence as well that we have about the climate crisis and climate action. When you look at the demographics in German politics, they're very important. You know, the age that a voter has does determine his political inclinations to some extent. The older Germans are not that concerned about climate. I wonder if there's anything that the younger Germans who are going to be affected by this can do to switch that perception? We need to ask the question, like, why would people not find climate action important, given that that's the most existential crisis we've ever experienced? And that has, of course, to do with politicians pretending that this crisis wasn't a big deal, pretending that the climate crisis was just an issue of activists and of scientists, and pretending that real politics cares about real issue and that's everything but the climate crisis. So, of course, people take that as an example, and, of course, people look around to, to political leaders um, when making a decision about how important the climate crisis might be to them. You say the, the science has been very clear, but politicians have painted climate as a question of activism, perhaps a political bias too. What do you respond to politicians that say, you guys are so hysterical, you're creating panic about the environment. How do you respond to that? Yeah, that's a, um, we hear that a lot. Politicians coming up to us um, saying that we need to be more patient and that we shouldn't, you know, paint such apocalyptic pictures because people would be, you know, uh, unsettled by that. And honestly, I wish we wouldn't have to do that. I wish we wouldn't have to talk about the crisis every day. And I wish we wouldn't have, or we wouldn't feel the need to wake up this country and the society um, and, you know, point out that there's a crisis every day. This should be the job of politicians and it should be their job to to speak to the people about the crisis ahead and our plans to fix it and our plans to challenge that crisis and um, but given that's not happening someone has to do that and that politicians don't like it well i'm sorry for them and uh, we have a crisis to deal with and if you know those in charge are not rising up to the responsibility we're doing it fine well, that was German climate activist Luisa Neubauer speaking with our Maria Tadeo. Let's discuss now how climate policies could actually impact the election. We're back with Marcel Fretscher and Bernhard Grünebeil are still both with us. Bernhard, if we go back to some of the things that we were talking about, maybe some of the climate change and other policies that will really dominate um, some of the things that we're looking at, give us a sense of high energy prices. Are voters worried about energy prices spurring into inflation? or they look at energy through the lens of climate change? Well, I would say it's rather energy prices through the lens of inflation at the moment, um, because energy prices in the, through the lens of, of climate, it's, it's more of a, a longer-term topic. But still, um, bo both are relevant, and both um, factors need to be um, factored in in the election decision. Uh, so I also um, would guess that it's more or less uh, along the same line of demographics as you stated it before. So I guess um, for the short term in, in, in politics, it's rather the inflation topic and whether you, you feel it in your own um, pocket uh, if energy prices go up. But it's also important for the climate issue, of course. Yeah. Uh, Marcel, how do you see high energy prices becoming an election issue? Um, higher energy prices are not yet an election issue. I think people are more worried about the future. And the narrative of uh, some of the parties is uh, having good jobs in the future 
and climate protection are a contradiction. That's a narrative uh, that, uh, that people believe. Uh, we must not forget um, the 2010s were very good economic years in Germany. We have record low unemployment, uh, wages have been increasing. So people are looking back to the past and say, we want to go back there. And some political parties are very successful in saying, look, um, if we move too quickly on climate protection, it will destroy many good jobs. And I think that's a challenge for politicians to explain exact opposite is the case. Climate policies and good economic policies are two sides of the same coin. Um, and uh, for Germany to keep the success it has had, being very competitive uh, in global markets, German export companies being very strong, uh, to keep that competitive advantage, uh, Germany needs to move quickly in the economic and climate transition. And I think that kind of awareness, um, that, that's where the population is split during this election. Some people have understood that, others are afraid of their jobs, and some politicians are very successful uh, in fear-mongering uh, and making climate protection uh, look as if it was bad economic policy. Marcel, I have a very good question, actually, from a viewer that is writing in. Please, everyone, you know, send as many questions as you want. We love interacting with our viewers. Um, this person's writing in, Marcel, and they're basically asking, is there any sign that Germany might ever consider its energy space on nuclear? Um, there are discussions. As you know, Germany um, took a decision, the chancellor took a decision to exit nuclear power about 10 years ago after the, the Japanese uh, tsunami and, and nuclear disaster. Um, but I think that has very little chance uh, of happening that we now reconsider in Germany the issue of nuclear. Because we know from many scientific studies that uh, building nuclear plants is actually very expensive. It's actually a lot more expensive than renewable energy by now. Uh, and um, so I don't see Germany um, uh, taking the path of, of uh, uh, changing course. But of course, we have many other European countries like France uh, that built a lot of their production on, on nuclear power. And uh, I think we need to find a European solution to that. And um, I see uh, the need for that to be phased out slowly. Um, but for Germany, I don't think this is an issue. Uh, Bernard, do, do you actually see, you know, nuclear coming back? And there's also a very good question, actually, on what the next German government can do for automakers, but also other industries to make the transition to a greener economy easier. I agree. This was what uh, Marcel Fraubscher just said um, regarding nuclear stance of German politics. But we have to keep in mind um, that we need a, a European uh, regulation on that. Um, angle as well, because in the end, um, if I speak from, from a from a financial markets perspective, we have the taxonomy in Europe, and there you need to define whether, for example, nuclear energy is taxonomy aligned or not. And I'm sure that um, there are parts of Europe who will, will, will lo would love um, to, to have nuclear energy um, yeah, rubber stamped uh, as um, sustainable. And in Germany, um, we see it differently. So we have to to work uh, around this issue and, um, well, as it's um, usual in, in politics, we will obviously see some, some um, yeah, middle way, uh, I would say. Um, and in the end, um, German politics, I would say, for after the next election is uh, not changing course dramatically, but it's rather a question whether we will have um, more regulation and obligations for, for companies re, um, regarding climate policy or whether we will have more incentives and subsidies on the other hand um, of, of the spectrum. And we need to, to position ourselves and find, find a middle way on that. And for the financial markets, we need to um, build portfolios that are robust on, on different outcomes of the election regarding that specific issues of, of climate policy. Okay. Thank you both for joining us for a good conversation. The DIW director, Marcel Fretscher, and Bayern Invest head of ESG research, Bernard Grunegel. Now, coming up, BMW boosts its battery orders on EV demand. Its chief executive tells Bloomberg the chip shortage is here to stay for months. Up next, we're live at the Munich Motor Show. This is Bloomberg.
BMW is a customer-centric organization, and we follow the market. And the first results in 2024 of the first half year showed that we are gaining market share, we are growing, we have a sustainable business approach, and now electromobility is really keeping up the pace, and we are right in the middle of it. You see it with the i4 and the iX, we, which we have here, which, which, uh, the, which, which, which generate a really enormous response from the markets. So we are right in there, and we are very posit uh, uh, positive about our future. Well, that was BMW Chief Executive Oliver Zipse speaking to Bloomberg at the Munich Motor Show. Now, the International Motor Show has found a new home in Munich after almost seven decades in Frankfurt. My colleague and co-anchor Matt Miller is in the Bavarian capital for us. Matt, I'm really looking forward to every day talking to me about cars because you're so excited about them that I get so excited about them. So what's hot that you're looking at? Um, well, it's hot. Well, you know, I just saw the new all-electric Mercedes G-Class, and I have to say that's probably one of the cars people are most excited about. It's only a concept right now, but we know they're bringing it out probably next year. Um, there aren't as many cars here as there are at a typical car show. At Geneva, at Detroit, at New York, you see a lot more vehicles. This conference is really this um, this auto show is really more about the mobility side of things so the self-driving technology the battery technology um, and the kind of mobility models business models that um, car makers are counting on for a huge part of their revenue um, in the next decade or so it's less about the actual iron and air the metal and rubber um, that I usually get the most excited about but there are still a few cars sprinkled here and there you did tell me there were some really, really cool cars. So how much of the focus is now on EVs? You know, Matt, is it all about EVs or is there still space for like the, the more traditional, you know, diesel guzzling cars? It's mostly all about EVs. I mean, you heard Oliver Tipsa there. He was talking with my colleague Elizabeth Behrman about the fact that they've just put in a $24 billion order for battery cells. Um, it's also very much about chips. I think, you know, mobility is the stated theme of this um, car show, but the real talk is about when are we going to get the chips we need? How are we going to allocate those chips to the products that we're making? Are we going to get as many battery cells as our competitors? So it's really a scramble for supply chain um, or supplies, I should say, as the supply chain faces bottlenecks and there's so much demand for these new higher tech products. I mean, I want to ask you how exciting it is actually being at a conference with real people around you, because I know we haven't done it in about 18 months, but I need to ask you probably about the chips. How much of a delay will there be, Matt? Well, you know what? The delay seems like it's worse than had been anticipated. I was talking to the CEO of Volkswagen, Herbert Dies, and he said, yeah, we were, we were hoping at the end of the summer this would be dealt with, but now we're in another crisis situation, and it could be months, it could be years before we've dealt with this. So they're doing as much as they can to produce. They're having um, to ask for government help in, you know, bringing chip manufacturing back to Germany, just as American manufacturers want to bring it back to the U.S. In terms of being at a show, um, being at an actual event, seeing people that I haven't Fun. seen since March of 2019, which is the last <laughs> car show, it's exciting, but I think, you know, I've gotten about 20 messages from our HR department today because yeah. they're so worried that I might get COVID. Matt Miller. All right. Miller on the loose. Watch out. This is Bloomberg. There is a spike in inflation right now, this year, and we have to uh, avoid that it becomes structural. There is a need to invest more in semiconductors so that uh, we can get, get rid of this dependency. The second half is more difficult, and that is what we see now. It is more difficult. It's here to stay the problem for many months. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. 
Disappointing jobs numbers, the smallest increase in seven months, adds to uncertainty over the Fed's taper timeline, while U.S. markets are closed for Labor Day. Aluminium surge prices hit a decade high as a coup in Guinea fuels concerns over supply of a key raw material. Plus, we're live at the Munich Auto Show. We'll bring you our conversations with the chief executives of VW and BMW, plus many more. Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, to all of our American viewers and friends, happy Labor Day. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Tom McKenzie is with me. Kelly Lines off today for the holiday. Matt Miller will be joining us from the Munich Auto Show. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining me. There's quite a lot going on in the markets. Treasuries, of course, closed. A lot of the U.S. markets are closed. But after the NFP number, it'll be interesting to see exactly how market position themselves ahead of the uh, Fed minutes later on this week. Or yeah, the beige book. Mm. Yeah. I was just going to say investors obviously taking into account a change in that time frame for, for the taper. There was a view that from some that maybe you're going to get it in September. The announcement that now has been pushed back, at least by the likes of Bloomberg Economics, our own in-house team. Maybe November, maybe December in terms of when that taper uh, starts to kick in. Uh, a divergent pitch when he comes to those non-farm payrolls. Of course, the number, the overall number missed, but the wage growth uh, was quite substantial. We're focusing on what's happening in the markets in Asia, closing very much uh, in the green for China. Uh, there's a view from Nomura that maybe you're at a point where these regulatory pressures have bottomed. Certainly you saw some upside for technology stocks like Tencent in the session today. Japan continues to provide some positive headwinds uh, for Asia on the back of those changes politically in the view that maybe you're going to get additional uh, fiscal support. So the CSI 300 over in China gaining uh, more than 1.8% closing the session uh, much higher. Shanghai almost Pairing all of the losses since February. So that continues the upside for Chinese stocks. 11 straight days of flows of, from foreign investors from the stock net onto uh, the mainland. That has been underpinning uh, some of that optimism in China. That has fled through into what we're seeing in Europe. Uh, you've seen gains uh, across the European session and across the indexes. You had some data out from Germany uh, pointing to some upside for the factory sector for the month of July. Uh, the CAC 40 uh, it was also positive. The FTSE 100, you had the CBI coming out and giving the government here a tongue lashing about concerns around supply chains. Francie. Yeah, it's really interesting, Tom. So if you look at European stocks, they're actually on the high, gaining some half a percent. Again, mm. low volumes because of Labor Day. The focus is on the fact that if the Fed needs to do more, that will be quite supportive of some of these cyclical assets in Europe. But it was interesting, though, that the reaction on Friday after the jobs report was the market really not knowing what to do. Is it worse than expected, meaning that we'll get extra Fed stimulus, or is it actually so bad that it means the economy is tanking? The other one I'm watching out for is aluminium hitting a decade high amid political unrest in Guinea. So we'll have a lot more on that. Aluminium commodities definitely at the forefront. And then, Tom, I also want to get your thoughts on China. Now, after almost seven decades in Frankfurt, the International Motor Show has found a new home in Munich. The IAA in the Bavarian capital will be Europe's first major car showcase in two years, a chance for automakers to show off the fruits of their labor. But car makers like Audi will be sending smaller teams and the show is overshadowed by concerns that major deal opportunities could be canceled amid a COVID resurgence. Well, my co-anchor, Matt Miller, is in Munich for us. Matt, I get so excited when you're at an auto show. I know I'm not as excited as you are, but the focus is actually on batteries, I guess, chips and mobility. Yes, and the aluminium. We can add many syllables and still there isn't enough of it, right? The problem is they have shortages of almost everything they need to build cars at a time when demand is just shooting higher and rates are so low that uh, most people are able to borrow and buy these cars. So they really need to figure out a way to get enough batteries. They really need to figure out a way to get enough chips. And they thought that at the end of the summer, um, these shortages would um, would be solved. The problem is that they haven't. So now they're looking months or even years into the future before they can deal with that. And they're having to figure out which of their units or which of their products deserves the supplies that they do have and able to boost margins to a higher level. Yeah, Matt, some really important lines that you managed to extract, extract from the executives there on the ground in Munich about their views on supply chain semiconductors. Uh, how is that positioning the automakers? How are they restructuring or reconfiguring their business to, to cope with those, those constraints? Well, they have um, really three major focuses. They might say two. One is producing more electric vehicles. So they're allocating the, what, uh, what supplies they can get to the electric vehicles 
in order to boost those sales. The other thing is uh, that they're focused on really is mobility. Um, they expect to get some of them 15 to 20 percent or even more of their revenue from mobility solutions. That's jargon for car sharing or taxi uh, ride service, ride hailing services, even delivery services. And then the third um, leg of the stool really is China. And this is, I think, where there's even less visibility because everybody wants to be a big player. Volkswagen is already the biggest um, foreign player in China, but no one really knows what regulation is going to be like going forward. And they all have joint ventures working with state owned companies. So they really need to be careful in China, but they can't avoid it. And they really need to allocate their resources to mobility and EVs, which need, for example, both of those uh, a lot of chips. Miller, that's all well and good, but I want to know what cool little sports car you and I are getting to go on the surveillance early edition road trip, you know, ahead of the German election. I, you know what? I like the Polestar 1. It's not a brand new car, but it's very limited in okay. production. They're only making 1,500. I think it is still the most beautiful car at this show, even though the first time I saw it was in March of 2019. And I think you would like it a lot as well, Francine. Very good for the environment. Okay, I like that, the fact that it's good for the environment, even if it's not Italian-made, or we get one of those, like, booster cars with, you know, the goggles. I think they would suit me great. And you can do the driving, Matt Miller, at the Munich Motor Show, of course, joining us again throughout the program. Now, aluminium has climbed to the highest in more than a decade. This, as political unrest in Guinea, actually fueled concerns of a supply of the raw material needed for the metal. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Paul Richardson. So, Paul, in order to make aluminium, or aluminum, if you're American, you need bauxite. What do we understand this coup means for, you know, the, the, the mining of bauxite and actually bringing it to and from where it's needed? It, it's essentially a constraint on, on the supplies of the raw material out of Guinea. Um, as things stand, we're trying to establish what um, what the situation is in terms of moving um, supply in and out of Guinea. The coup leaders yesterday closed the country's land borders. Um, we're trying to establish whether that affects the ports as well. As things stand, we understand that the, uh, the ports remain open. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it obviously has a significant impact on, um, on supplies, given it's such a big uh, producer of bauxite, the world's biggest exporter. OK, Bloomberg's uh, Paul Richardson on the implications of, of the coup in Guinea, what that means for bauxite and the, the impact, the flow-on impact to, uh, to the aluminium space, of course, as well. And we've seen the prices uh, jumping to above uh, decade highs uh, today. OK, let's switch focus to the US economy, adding uh, 235,000, just 235,000 jobs in August. That was the smallest gain in seven months. The soft report seems likely to prompt Fed policymakers to delay tapering. Francine, the top line was obviously a big surprise in terms of the forecast, but the wage growth was quite substantial. Yeah. Some of the guests we've had on this morning suggesting that maybe that is the silver lining here. Yeah, I don't I have to say markets were all over the place mm. on Friday, right? Because they saw this huge miss and then they say, right, but then maybe if you have wage growth, it's inflationary. Does it mean that the economy is really much worse than expected, which means that even if there's stimulus from the Fed, it won't do much or actually does it warrant more stimulus? I mean, we had two hours where you saw volatility like up and down for equities. I think now they're maybe stabilizing a, a little bit, Tom, but you're right. It's all about the wage growth. So is it I mean, why are people not filling those, you know, those places is it because they're holding out uh, for better jobs that would be inflationary but it would also point to a strong economy or is it j just that people would rather stay at home I don't have mm. the answer to that but it's probably what traders are trying to figure out well, well let's get more on that then with M lives uh, Heather Burke uh, Heather uh, what is the investment community's assessment then uh, of this very mixed picture that we got on the jobs front where it leaves us in terms of the tapering time frame frame and dare I say it the dot plot as well good morning the, the jobs report didn't really seem to please anybody on Friday because you had stocks ended the week a little changed. Um, you had yields ba really didn't budge for the week on 10-year treasuries. Basically, you had this confluence of disappointing payrolls and also higher than expected wage inflation. Um, U.S. futures, the cash markets are closed today, seem to be up a little bit today. So stock traders may be thinking, OK, this is going to de delay Fed action. The consensus among markets is that most likely a Fed tapering decision will be delayed from September, perhaps into November. But this also raises questions about 
are we going to be seeing a long period of wage inflation? In, in fact, some one uh, reader on Friday on the blog brought up the specter of 1970s stagflation. Uh, Heather, what can you tell us about, I mean, I imagine that what markets now want to know is, you know, they want to hear from Fed presidents to have an idea of what exactly they make out of uh, the, um, the jobs report on Friday. So what's the next data point or what's, you know, when's the next time they can hear from, from someone from the Fed? Well, we've got, you know, we'll have some Fed speakers coming up and in, going into the meeting on September. But the meeting in mid-month will definitely probably be the focus where we'll see how the Fed has processed the job reports from last week. Okay, Heather, thank you very much uh, for those insights. Uh, Heather Burke of Bloomberg Markets Live. Coming up this hour, we're going to speak to SOCGEN Chief FX Strategist Kit Jukes. We'll discuss the U.S. jobs miss, of course, and look at the risks ahead for the ECB. That meeting later this week. Your markets in Europe are pointing up solidly in green territory. The futures as well in the U.S. Labor Day closed cash trade, but futures are positive by two tenths of a percent. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with Tom McKenzie. Katie Lines is off today. Matt Miller is on the ground in Munich. So let's get straight to the markets. Again, thin volumes or thin compared to other days just because it's the 6th of September, which means that it's a bank holiday in the U.S. Happy Labor Day, everyone, if you're American near and far. Now, the NFP reaction on Friday, non-farm payrolls, was, I have to say, remarkably bland, given that uh, what a large miss it was. That was according to our Mark Cudmore. Today, European stocks actually rising. U.S. equity futures also rising at the margin. Investors now betting that a slower hiring in the U.S. may delay tapering by the Fed and uh, also look at aluminium hitting a decade high amid this political unrest in Guinea. Now, joining us to talk about the markets, NFP, to talk about inflation and everything in between is our Eddie van der Velt of Bloomberg Markets Live. Eddie, always great to speak to you. We also have the ECB on Thursday, but what's the main question that you want answered after that non-farm payroll number on Friday? Yeah, I, look, I'm going to disagree a little bit with my boss here, Mark Cudmore. I think um, I, it's interesting that, yes, the closing level for the markets on Friday was, you know, muted. It was a fairly unspectacular. But during the trading session on Friday, it was there was a lot of excitement. And it was clear that traders were struggling to interpret that non-farm payrolls, uh, you know, read, um, particularly because, you know, we've had job, jobs numbers that were so disappointing and wage inflation that was such a big beat again. So I think that is really interesting. And, I, you know, I think back to your point, the, the most interesting thing for me going forward will be anecdotal data because the market needs to interpret and needs the Fed to interpret for them just exactly what it is that is going on in the underlying economy. Are we actually heading for this stagflation um, scenario? And for that reason, I think the beige book uh, is going to be the absolute most important thing this week. Eddie, are you seeing positioning around that stagflation trade? You know, it was really interesting on Friday because what we saw was we, we didn't see uh, the break-even rates move an awful lot. We saw uh, um, nominal yields, you know, bouncing on the news. And then at the same time, we saw gold bouncing on the news. We saw really different, uh, different readings on this. And I think the market just doesn't know what to make of it, uh, heads or tails. What does it mean for inflation, Eddie? So you could, you know, it's either a positive because you say, okay, inflation is high, and this is what you were telling us before. Maybe people just want to hold out until they have their dream job, or it could be a huge miss because actually the economy is losing a lot of steam. Yeah, I think so. I think that is the problem, right? I think we, we don't know. I think, you know, I did a poll on Twitter the other day where I asked people, look, where are we? Are we at the, at the at, you know, are we still in recession? Uh, where are we in the, in the business cycle? Are we still in recession? Are we seeing, um, you know, the early expansion phase? Or are we between double dips? And, and, and people don't know. Uh, I got a, such a wide range of responses on that. I think, you know, I think this is the problem for the Fed. The Fed does not want to take the stimulus away too soon. But at the same time, they are starting to see the whites of the eyes of inflation. And therefore, you know, they, they, they don't want to keep the, their, their foot on the gas pedal for too long. Mm. Eddie, I just want to get your views on the dollar. It, it's a surprise to some, maybe, you're seeing the strength that's coming through. Currently, euro dollar, for example, 118.63, so lower uh, on, the back of, on the back of a strong greenback, uh, despite the fact that the tapering question has been pushed out, arguably. What, what does it mean 
for, for emerging markets particularly, uh, where the, do the dollar direction at this point? Oh, the dollar is everything in markets yeah. right now at the moment, isn't it? I think you're absolutely, you nailed it there. Listen, I think, um, I think that, you know, the dollar, the dollar is the ultimate haven play um, in markets at the moment. And because people are struggling to interpret that uh, NFP number, I think there is a little bit of a bid on the dollar. What I'm interested to see is that the dollar, you know, is doing well. And at the same time, gold is doing well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's that, because that's not something that we see very often. There's, there's a real split at the moment in how the market is interpreting this. Okay, any excuse to talk about pets, Eddie? Because if you follow us on Twitter, Eddie and I spend a good amount of time actually, uh, you know, g g doing some banter, as the Brits would say, about what pets Eddie should get. And actually, there's a huge business story about it, right? Because just the number of pets that people own since the pandemic has skyrocketed, but now they're bringing them less to the vet. What's going on, Eddie? Yeah, Francine's trying to convince <laughs> me not to get a bunny, but to get a dog. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still up in the air. Uh, there's been huge demand for pets uh, ever since the first lockdown, and it's you know we're seeing some of that feed through into the stock into the stock markets. Uh, pets companies and pet supply companies have been doing really well, but now the narrative is as people go back to their uh, you know to their offices and so on, perhaps some of that demand you know for pets and for pet supplies will start falling. I don't know if that's true. I mean, you know, if people have already bought the pets, they, they're still going to have to, you know, buy the supplies for, for a number of years in the future. We shall see. Okay, Eddie, I have... Okay, if the Fed tapers before October, you get a dog. If it's after, you get a rabbit. I mean, how's that? <laughs> if you trust the markets, you trust the markets. And right. if you don't... Well, you know, that's, as, that's as something as good as anything to position on right now. Where does, which pet do you want Eddie to get? I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because at the moment, the market fundamentals are just so, so hard to read. All right, we're going to watch that one very closely indeed, <laughs> Eddie, and his uh, focus on bunnies, or not, depending on what happens with the taper. Eddie van der Volt, thank you very much, our Markets Live team and all things Fed and pets. Coming up, European ministers and EU officials weigh the risks posed by inflation. We're going to hear from the top guest that spoke to Bloomberg at the Ambrosetti Forum. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie, Francine Lacroix in London with Tom McKenzie. Kelly Lines is off today and Matt Miller is on the ground in Munich. To our American friends far and wide, happy Labor Day. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News and the price of aluminium climbed. That's something that we keep on looking at, climbing to its highest in more than a decade following a military coup in Guinea. The West African nation is a major exporter of bauxite, the raw material used to make the metal. Now, the head of Guinea's special forces says he took action to address financial mismanagement and corruption. In the UK, it's likely to be a tough week for the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson in Parliament. Today, he'll be forced to defend his handling of the Afghanistan crisis. Plus, Johnson faces a backlash from his own Conservative Party over reports he's planning or he is planning a tax hike on workers for boosting funding for social care. Well, that's something the party has pledged not to do. President Biden's chief medical advisor says booster shots against the coronavirus are likely to start only with the vaccine by Pfizer and BioNTech. Well, Anthony Fauci told CBS the Moderna shot may be delayed. Those comments may lead to more clarity on the administration's stance. While some medical experts are unhappy over what they see as political interference in the review process for the shots. And it was a record-breaking weekend for the first Marvel film featuring an Asian superhero. Now, the Disney movie, chang chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings took in more than $71 million at theaters in the U.S. and Canada. That blew past estimates and was the biggest opening for a movie over the Labor Day weekend. I have to say, Tom, I haven't been to the theater in quite some time. I'm looking forward to James Bond that apparently is, could be delayed once more. And my sympathies to you, because I know at number four, Disney has Paw Patrol. You have younger kids than I, so you'll probably end up having to sit through two hours of pop. Yeah, I pray, please, no. <laughs> I, I'm hoping to wean my daughter off that before the movie comes out because th uh, that, that is quite something to be dragged into that for two hours. But yeah, look, this is a good win for Disney. They didn't do so well with Mulan, which was, of course, aiming for that Asian audience as well, the Chinese audience. But they got, what, Shang-Chi uh, got, uh, got 70, 71 million, as you said, Shang-Chi. Shang, by the way, meaning up or increasing and chi energy, increasing energy. So it's done really well on its opening day in, in, in the labor market, in, on Labor Day, I should say. Uh, 
Uh, but, but Paw Patrol will be giving a miss, uh, Francie. Okay. Yeah, that's what you think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know your kids are watching Bloomberg now. We're talking about Paw Patrol, and they'll you probably say, like, you know, uh, Papa, we need to go and see Paw Patrol. I'm interested, Tom, to talk about China because, mm. you know, we're trying to figure out exactly what this change in terms also how they crack down or how they deal with celebrities means for foreign investors. I mean, you've lived in China. Um, you've just come back from China. I, any insight into exactly how much they can still crack down? Well there's, well, there's obviously a lot more that they can do in terms of squeezing some of these sectors, but it is remarkable because that that industry built up around celebrities is substantial. So they're taking aim at that. Bad news for the celebrity fans out there. Maybe parents will be cheering this on, though, Fran. Yeah, maybe. We'll talk about Europe shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with Tom McKenzie. K Lines is off. Matt Miller will be joining us from the Munich Auto Show. Tom, first of all, uh, good morning and thank you so much for being with us. I know a lot of people are off in the U.S. because it's Labor Day, mm. which means that a lot of traders are off. Also, treasuries aren't really open in terms of cash treasuries. So actually, volume is going to be pretty thin. Yeah, absolutely. Look, as we were discussing with Eddie prior to the break, there is this confusion still amongst investors as to how to interpret the jobs data. 235,000 was the print, but the wage growth was much higher. How do you play that into your views on the taper, the dot plot maybe, the inflation expectations? Are we in a stagflationary environment? We wanted to touch on China as well because that is a factor. They handed a strong baton over to the European session uh, in terms of the Chinese markets. You had the likes of Nomura saying that maybe uh, you've reached the bottom in terms of these regulatory challenges. Let's yeah. check in then on the markets across Europe it's still positive the mood music is upbeat on this uh, Monday morning up uh, six tenths of a percent the futures in the US of course the cash trade is closed futures in the US are also up two tenths of a percent we wanted to focus on aluminum of course the price rises there up uh, more than one percent so you're a decade highs. This is a result of the political turmoil in Guinea, which is a producer of bauxite, which goes into the production of aluminium. So that is a, another inflationary aspect to bear in mind as well. Crude, uh, slightly lower by nine tenths of a percent. The Saudis cutting prices by about 50 percent to try and push in uh, to those Asian markets. Fran. Yeah, now we've also been hearing from finance and economy ministers from across the European Union as they weigh the risks posed by rising eurozone inflation. Now they spoke to Bloomberg from the Ambrosetti Forum over the weekend. I don't think that it should come as any surprise that there is a spike in inflation right now, this year. We are not concerned by uh, the current level of uh, inflation uh, in the EU or everywhere in the world. Inflation is uh, very much influenced by energy prices and food prices. All the institutions consider that it will be a transitory feature and we have to uh, avoid that it becomes structural. We think that this increase is a temporary one. We are monitoring it and we should monitor it very accurately, uh, but without um, going to uh, conclusions too soon. We remain vigilant, but we are not concerned. It is a natural feature of a very strong recovery that we are witnessing. Well, European finance ministers there are speaking about inflation at the Ambrosetti Forum in Italy. Well, joining us now is Kit Jukes, he's chief FX strategist at Societe Generale. Kit, good morning, first of all. Um, let's talk about the dollar, second of all, after that jobs number on Friday. What happens to dollar now? Um, I, I think we, we're in a period where it might be softer for a, for a week or two just because we're back to... Um, we're back to a relatively risk-friendly environment. If people are going to be less pessimistic about China, uh, it still looks as if the first Fed rate hike has is, is been firmly kicked into, if not the long grass, the 2023 grass, which is too far away for me to think about it too hard. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're, the markets are willing to, at the moment, look through the Delta variant and say, yeah, look, this is a temporary phenomenon. Now we'll see where we go. Um, the, uh, the, the, the next leg up for the dollar, I think, you know, in the, in the long run, it comes really when we focus on um, the timing of the Fed rate hikes and really get back to looking at the front end of the U.S. curve. And I suspect mm. the next worry about that comes from the belief in the market that, uh, that a lot of these policymakers are, are a bit complacent about, uh, about the inflation outlook in the next six months. I think we're going to get at least one scare on that front.
Uh, at least one scare, scare on the inflation front. Kit, where is your, you, you talk about the importance, of course, of the taper than the timeline. Where is your timeline now? How have you changed that view on the back of the jobs numbers on Friday? Um, the, the jobs numbers, I think, just means that the, the idea that we get a taper announced uh, at the September FOMC meeting is, is pretty remote. Uh, that means it gets announced um, at the beginning of November. Uh, that, in turn, means that it's really hard to have finished the taper until late in, late in 2022. And, and, and then if, 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 there's, you know, if there's a gap of any kind, we're into 2023 for the first rate hike. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of movable parts in terms of how the economy reacts mm. and how the markets react to tapering. But it, it's a long way out now. That, that's really what the jobs number did. It, it reinforced the Jay Powell message. Uh, Kit, what's scarier in your eyes, deflation or inflation? Uh, in my eyes now, inflation, just because of where we've got. It's interesting. You know, um, we've had 20 years of, um, of being scared of deflation, if you like, since Alan Greenspan gave us 1% rates at the end of the Asian crisis. And we've had equity markets that have gone up such a long way since then. And I think inflation is scarier now because of the asset price inflation that we've had, that squeezing inflation out could be very painful. Um, it's kind of I was half thinking you wind the clock all the way back to 1971 and, and, uh, and President Nixon when he was really worried about jobs, not inflation, when he got rid of the gold standard, uh, you know, and got rid of the Bretton Woods system. Uh, I, I think now, you know, that, that I don't know whether there's complacency about the, the medium term inflationary dangers, but I, I inflation and having to hike rates and fight inflation, even in slowing economies, could be pretty painful because specifically of what we've done to asset prices and to debt levels over the course of the last 20 years. Mm. Kit, what is your view then on, on commodity currencies? Is the bearishness that we've seen in some of the commodities FX overdone? Um, yeah, yes, but it's likely to be persistent. But it, you know, it's not just that they're commodity mm. currencies that, that traded on the, back of the, uh, on the back of the Chinese issue. You've got, you know, you've got a, a lot of individual political stories in places like Chile. You've obviously got somewhere like Australia where, you know, in between rolling lockdowns and an exceptionally dovish central bank, um, the currency looks dirt cheap to me. And I can't think of any reason why it would get significantly stronger with the current arrangements in place. So, so I think the, co the commodity currencies need, you know, a decent following wind, kind of a defeat of the Delta variant, return to more positive global growth story. There's, there's, quite, a, there's quite a sort of an army of things that get that get need, need to fall in place to get them going higher. But, you know, let's be fair, this year's top currency is the South African Rand. So, you know, there's money that wants to go and look for yield, wants to go for these growth stories if, if, it, if it gets unleashed. But it's, it's, it's still just messy, more than, more than easy to turn around and say, yeah, let's just go and buy them all. Um, Kit, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you have, you know, big thoughts on uh, the coup in Guinea or aluminium or bauxite, but does it actually point to supply chain constraints? I mean, it's incredible that, you know, a coup, I, I know they're um, a country that's very rich on bauxite, you know, leads to aluminium actually at a 10 year high. What do you do with these supply chain constraints? Are they bigger and actually more aggressive than expected? And so do you worry about the world economy in six, eight months? I, I think we worry that they're pretty big, that they're, they're a vulnerability for the global economy. They're pretty big in the short term. By and large, what happens is they spike up and we find a way around them. So you get a period where, uh, where this causes, causes short-term pain, but not more than that. You know, the, the kind of the geopolitical dependence on, on you know, some, some specific countries uh, to provide us with a whole load of, of raw materials that we need, and specific countries that many of us can't find on a map and don't understand the domestic politics, uh, is, is something that we're going to have to live with. But, but so far, the pattern has been we find a go around, we find a solution um, after, a, after a scare. Mm. Uh, look, Francine talked about the, the growth prospects, the global growth prospects, and you're, the, and you're right, the complexities of, of issues like Guinea. Uh, when it comes to China, obviously a major component of that global growth, uh, you're looking at a yuan that has been relatively stable despite all the regulatory changes we've seen, trading in a tight range for the last three months. Does that continue, do you think, for the Chinese currency? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's clearly, you know, another reminder. I mean, A, the yuan is incredibly important. B, the yuan is not a free-floating currency. There's absolutely no way it would be here. Um, and, and I think C, perhaps more important than anything else, the Chinese authorities have clearly decided 
that while they try this juggling act of containing some sectors of their economy while trying to get enough growth for, 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 for others, which is a really difficult juggling act to get right, um, one of the things they don't need is the additional headache of a volatile currency. So, I, you know, I think it can weaken more than it can strengthen because that's the, that's, that's the, the balance of risk from here. But I don't think it's going to cause major eruptions. It's, it's in terms of something like the euro, you know, if, if it would get significantly stronger, it would let the euro rally up above 120. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. But I don't think we're heading back to seven. But it's exciting because it's ECB week. What are you expecting from the ECB on Thursday? Noise, lots of noise, not lots of action, noise. but lots of noise. Um, yeah. Well, we've got hawks. We've got hawks in town. Um, there's no. There's a debate. You know, there is a debate um, com coming out of the ECB in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, of what to do about policy normalisation. Maybe someone at the ECB will use the word tapering, which has never happened. But um, you know, so th there is a debate to be had. But in, in, in the great scheme of things, you know, the ECB stuck at, at le less than zero rates. Uh, and it and is going to be there for a very long time. And, and that bit, unfortunately, doesn't change. OK, we'll have to brace ourselves for that noise, hopefully cut through some of it when the ECB meets later this week. Kit, thank you, as ever, for your insights. Kit Jukes uh, joining us there from Sokja. OK, plenty more ahead. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. We were able to largely compensate for our customers' the effects. And as I said uh, some weeks ago, the second half is more difficult. And that is what we see now. It is more difficult. It's here to stay the problem for many months. Um, but we are intensively working with our suppliers uh, to compensate the effect for, for our customers. We will remain in shortages for the next months or even years because semiconductors are in high demand, Internet of Things is growing and the capacity ramp up will take time. So it will be probably uh, a bottleneck for the next months and years to come. The chief executives there of BMW and Volkswagen speaking about the chip shortage at the IAA Motor Show. Now, after almost seven decades in Frankfurt, the International Motor Show has found a new home in Munich. Our co-anchor, Matt Miller, is in the Bavarian capital for us. Matt, a car show with visitors. I mean, this is a novelty after the pandemic. How much excitement is there on the ground? It is pretty exciting, actually, and um, the auto show is pretty full of visitors. Obviously, it's mostly press and um, you know corporate guests today, but there are a lot of them here, and there really aren't very many cars here. In fact, a lot of car makers haven't even bothered to come. Uh, Lamborghini and Porsche aren't here. They're in Munich, but they're in um, different places. Um, Ferrari, of course, isn't here because none of the Italian Stellantis isn't here. Um, Peugeot Citroën uh, isn't here. So what we do see are a lot of companies like Way. I'm standing next to a, a Way stand or you can see Bosch over there. So a lot more suppliers um, than you would typically see at a car show. Really um, outweighing the actual car manufacturers. The Daimler stand is here. There is a Volkswagen stand as well as BMW, but they haven't brought so much product. It's more about mobility. It's about the batteries. It's about um, the, the, the future solutions that they're going to provide and the tech and software involved in that. Yeah, that in-car entertainment uh, seems to be in focus then with, with those suppliers on the ground there. Uh, Matt, what are you seeing from, from the Chinese car makers? Um, you know, I haven't really seen anything from the Chinese car makers. Huh. Are there Chinese car makers hmm. here? I'm not really sure. My attention instantly <laughs> goes 
to the bright and shiny new objects with a star or uh, you know a propeller. I see BMWs, Mercedes, and I overlook the Great Wall or whatever the Chinese car makers are called. One thing I have seen, and I know that you know this, and many of our viewers um, will have figured it out as well, is a Swedish product that is owned by a Chinese car maker. So we were talking about Polestar. Mm. I think it is the most beautifully designed uh, new car you can get right now, the Polestar 1. It's an offshoot of Volvo. It was a sub-brand, and now they're um, separating themselves a little bit more with an IPO soon. But of course, that's owned by Geely. So I guess that counts. Does that count as a Chinese car maker? Yes. I'm going to say yes, an authoritative yes. So that's like exactly. I mean, we're talking about Polestar because we're looking for a surveillance early edition car. But you're telling me that it's it's less about the new cars. It's more about, you know, green. It's more about batteries and it's more about mobility, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, everyone's trying to get as many batteries as they can. BMW said they're putting in $24 billion worth of orders for batteries. Everyone's trying to figure out where to send the chips they can source. So Herbert Dees, you know, he's got to decide, do I give the chips that I have to the Volkswagen brand or do I give more of them to Bentley, Lamborghini, Bugatti and uh, Porsche? Um, you know, he's got a lot of, uh, uh, of managers under him that are saying, you know, give them to us. We need them. And the chip shortage isn't going to be over anytime soon. The CEO of BMW, Oliver Sipsa, just told reporters he says it's going to last at least another six to 12 months. Mm. So we're in for a, a, a long, bumpy ride in terms of the supply chain. Matt Miller, now Italy is also looking to shield its supercar companies from the European Union's climate plans. Now, the EU, we understand, has a plan to phase out combustion engine vehicles by 2035. But Roberto Cingolani, Italy's Minister for Ecological Transmission, says he's in talks with the Commission about how these rules would impact brands like Bugatti, Ferrari and Lamborghini. Well, he spoke to us exclusively at the Ambrosetti Forum. The government is fully committed and supporting the idea that we have to phase out the combustion engine by the 2035 around that period this is under discussion at the moment and we are working on a, on a very large market in that gigantic market there is a niche which is the super high performance cars and the, the motor valley is, is a clear example uh, th there is of course at the moment a discussion ongoing with the, with the commission but this is relatively marginal i think the, the very important point is that those cars they need very special technology and they need batteries for the transition so uh, clearly one important step is that italy gets sort of autonomous in, pro in producing uh, high performance batteries for automotive applications and that's why uh, we are now launching the gigafactory program to to install in Italy a very large-scale production facility for batteries. And for the rest, I have to say that the technology skill of the Motor Valley is so high that I have no doubt that these people can find their own way. The point that is, of course, having all the um, uh, procurement line and all the components available and not to be dependent on other countries, for, for instance, for the batteries. So that was Roberto Cingolani, Italy's Minister for Ecological Transmission, speaking to us at the Ambrosetti Forum. So, Matt, if I understand correctly, um, you know, some countries, including Italy, could go to the Commission and say, we understand the rules, we'll do it, you know, your way, except for these, like, super brands where maybe we could have a little bit of an exception. I mean, if Italy starts doing it, Germany will start doing it, everyone else will follow. No, I don't think so. Um, well, maybe. You may be correct. We could see many countries push for exemp exemptions. But keep in mind that Ferrari and Lamborghini already get many exemptions because they make less than 10,000 cars a year. It's different with a company like Volkswagen, which uh, produces and sells 12 million cars a year, right? It doesn't really make a huge difference if you allow Ferrari to keep making um, their beautiful uh, naturally aspirated V12 engines. I'm going to blow your mind here very quickly, <laughs> Francine, and tell you something Please. that not a lot of people know. Bugatti is not an Italian car maker. It's actually I know. a French car maker. Um, it's, it's based in Molsheim, which used to be yeah. Germany, even though, yes? Okay. No, this is like Montclair. Because Italy like won't be French... fighting for Bugatti. 
I know, Miller, but I know, like, it's like Montclair. The, the French say Montclair is Italian, but the Italians claim it because the founder was Italian. Like, I think we've had this conversation before. No matter how much you say it, the Italians will always, in their yes. hearts, think that Bugatti's Italian. Erroneously, maybe. Well, the, uh, uh, the French founder of Bugatti, Ettore Bugatti, was born in Italy, and he then put his car factory in what was at the time Germany, but is now France. There you go. Okay, Matt Miller on the ground with uh, with some insights that only Matt Miller uh, can give us uh, on on the auto market. There, thank you very much indeed from the Munich uh, Auto Show. Of course, uh, tomorrow we have an exclusive interview with Lamborghini CEO Stefan Winkelmann. He's going to be speaking with Matt Miller. Do not miss it. And coming up, everything else to keep your eyes on this morning from Boris Johnson's tough return to Parliament amid a fight over taxes. To what exactly <laughs> is meant by common prosperity in Beijing? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua in London with Tom McKenzie. Kaylee Lines is off today for Labor Day. Matt Miller on the ground in Munich for the auto show. Now look at what else we're watching today. And I'm looking at the UK. I'm looking at what Boris Johnson's possible tax changes actually mean for uh, everyone from businesses to of course some of the people that live in this country what's interesting is that the UK Parliament is returning this week and he really is facing a backlash from member of the Conservative parties I made some of the reports that he's planning a manifesto breaking tax hike on British workers and that would be to boost funding for social care so we look um, Tom to see whether this has any impact of course on pound and then we have a pretty packed agenda for the rest of the week what's on your radar today? yeah so talking about taxes in the UK that segues nicely to what's happening in China where our team on the ground in Beijing have been interviewing uh, someone called Li Xia, Professor Li Xia, who is a professor of economics at Zhejiang University now the reason he's important is because he's an advisor has been an advisor uh, to the Chinese government on uh, prosperity on on inequality crucially and how to close that gap and he's been saying that taxes and the reform of the tax system in China particularly property tax could be key to that but he says you only need to do that you can only do that when the economy is booming so not right now when there's question marks about the health of the economy also saying that AI digital economy and asset inflation is a key reason why you've seen this blowout in terms of inequality China one of the most unequal unequal countries uh, in the world and we're seeing the government try and address some of those challenges now with mixed results of course fancy um, we can check in the markets as yeah. well in terms of how things are shaping up. It's been a broadly positive day, largely actually as a result of a handover. Uh, it's solidly in the green from China. Uh, the CSI 300 closing up uh, around 2%. Hong Kong was positive well. Tech shares uh, in the green. So you're seeing uh, European shares up 5 tenths of a percent. The futures over in the US. Happy Labor Day, of course, uh, gaining 2 tenths of a percent. The cash trading is, of course, uh, closed uh, yeah. today for, for the Labor Day holiday, Francine. Tom, I'm looking forward to the week. Actually, it's going to be a, a pretty busy week. So, mm. it, you know, US markets are shut for Labor Day, so people are off. And then it's this week that we could hear from Joe Biden, who he appoints, or if he keeps Jay Powell or whether he appoints a new uh, Fed chair. Then we have the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia. We have China trade data. I love hearing you talk about China because you understand it more than anyone. And then El Salvador's Bitcoin law takes effect this week as well. So it's going to be a busy week. Tom, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Surveillance next. <laughs>